Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So last time we talked about internal uh, economies of scale, where we saw that as the firm got larger, uh, it would be able to produce at a lower and lower cost. It turns out that economies of scale are, can also be associated not with the firm, the individual firm, but actually with the size of the industry itself. So this is a case that we would refer to as external economies of scale. Again, external only meaning external to the firm itself. What we'll see with external economies of scale, we get some different results from what we saw with monopolistic competition, internal economies of scale model that we uh, looked at in detail on Tuesday. So just let me see if I can give you an example of an external economy that might resonate with you to give you some sort of feel for this. So let's think about um, making TV programs in Southern California. Right? So if you went down to Southern California and you looked at all the different kinds of firms that were involved in TV uh, production, you would find a few very large firms. But mostly what you would find is an awful lot of really small firms, a lot of small production companies um, that don't really have very much except the ability to bring together lots of different resources from outside the company to make a TV program. But what do they need to bring in? They need lighting, right? So they've got to hire a lighting company. They need sound, so they need to bring in a sound company. They need uh, script writers, so they'll hire a script writing script writers or a company of script writers. Uh, they might need choreography. They might need costumes. They might need, I've never figured out what a best boy is, but I'm sure there's a company that supplies best boys. And all the variety of, of filming and film editing and post-production stuff. If you go down to Hollywood, what you find is there are a gazillion of these little firms. They're all over the place. Now, keep that in mind. And now let's think about, okay, we want to start our own TV production company. And we're going to make TV programs in Fargo, North Dakota. Because we like North Dakota, right? For whatever reason. So we decide, okay, let's start making movies here or TV programs here. So that's where we set up our production company. Then all of a sudden we realize, well, you know, we need a lighting company. And we can't actually afford to own a lighting, a lighting company because in TV programs, you make somewhere between 12 and 26 a year. And it's not 24 7, 365. And if you have to own the lights and the lighting company and the lighting technicians, you've got an awful lot of expenses for something that's not going to be used for the entire year. Now, of course, you don't have to do that. You could lease or hire a lighting company to pack up all of their equipment in Hollywood and fly it on an airplane back to Fargo, North Dakota, which of course would be very expensive, much more expensive than it would cost a production company in Southern California to hire that lighting company. And now you need to do that again for sound and film editing and filming and post-production and all the other things that are involved in making this TV show. So what you can see is if you've got an isolated production facility without all the specialized support around it, it's going to be much, much more expensive uh, in order to make those movies or TV programs. But now let's suppose that you just happen to have very deep pockets. Bill Gates likes you, so he's funded your first season. And you're cr not only critically acclaimed, you're the most popular program on TV. And so other people say, gee, there must be something in the water in Fargo, North Dakota. I think I'll set up a second production company there. So a second company comes in. Now notice when the second production company comes in, we still need to have lighting and we still need to have sound and filming and film editing and choreography and music and costumes and all those other types of things. But now when we bring it in from the outside, we can actually share the cost with the second production company. So the average cost for the first firm is now going to come down because the size of the industry in Fargo, North Dakota got bigger. And then if we added a third firm and a fourth firm and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and an eighth, again, we would be able to bring our average cost down, even though the size of each production company remained exactly the same. So this is an example of what we mean by external economies of scale. There actually turns out to be a fairly significant number of industries that this kind of description would work for. Furniture making, carpet making, um, semiconductors, um, investment banking, um, what else? Uh, car auto parts, parts that go into autos and trucks. So there are lots of industries where having all of this stuff clustered in the same geographic region can make the industry more efficient uh, as opposed to trying to do it in geographically dispersed areas. So we want to set this up as an industry having many firms. So notice right away we have a difference with monopolistic competition. The number of firms here is generally much larger than what we would see in a monopolistically competitive industry. We're still going to have slightly differentiated products, although they don't have to be hugely differentiated. So again, we've got substitutes. Uh, in some sense, we even have uh, close substitutes. We're going to assume economies of scale external to the firm, as I've just described. Again, this is a partial equilibrium analysis, so we're only going to be looking at this industry. We're not going to concern ourselves with where the resources come from or what effect it has on the production of other goods and services uh, in the economy. So these industry clusters work really well for a variety of reasons. Three in particular have been identified. The example that I gave you with TV production would be an example of having the ability to support specialized suppliers. But it might also be because of what we call labor market pooling. Typically, what you find is certain skill sets of workers have a tendency to cluster in particular areas. Oddly enough, there are a lot of investment bankers in New York. Right? And also because we have spillover, uh, knowledge spillover effects. A lot of what goes on in these industries is people moving from one small company to another small company, taking some of their intellectual capital with them, so that an industry secret derived in one firm, call it Hewlett Packard just to pick an example out of the air, might move very quickly to another firm like, say, Oracle, if the CEO was to change jobs or something like that. I mean, I know that wouldn't happen in the real world, but uh, there's a whole set of intellectual uh, knowledge that uh, gets flowing back and forth. So these specialized suppliers, the example that I gave you with uh, TV production was specifically oriented towards specialized suppliers. And this may, in fact, be one of the most critical components. Companies operating in isolation can't support specialized suppliers as a group of companies working in an, what we call an industrial cluster or a concentrated geographic region. So one of the things, for instance, that you would find down in Silicon Valley, where we also have lots of new startups, is we have very specialized financial firms. Sometimes they're called venture capitalists. Well, we don't see venture capitalists just spread out everywhere. We see venture capitalists, that kind of financing comes about where you have an ability to start new companies at a very rapid rate, and in particular where the technology is changing and it needs to be assessed. Pretty hard to get a banker to figure out all of that stuff, but a venture capitalist uh, can actually do that. So industrial clusters uh, have this ability to support uh, specialized suppliers uh, much more readily than what we see with individual companies. Yes? 
Can we think of external economies of scale with economies of agglomeration? Uh, there are differences, but yes. I mean, in the, you know, if you thought about a broad umbrella, we, we could put both of those under, under that same umbrella. Pulled labor markets is a second uh, reason for having industrialized, uh, I mean, um, industrial clusters. So let me give you an example from my own experience. For a number of years, I worked for Bank of America here in San Francisco in their capital markets division. That is investment banking, trading, stock and bond trading, those types of things. And um, San Francisco, as you may or may not know, is not the headquarters for investment banking or securities trading. It's not to say it doesn't take place, but it's not the major place. So when we would go into a recruiting market uh, to hire MBAs or new traders or right undergraduate students, one of the things that we found is that we were always in competition against New York firms, many of which have gone out of business since then, but that's another issue. Um, so we were always in competition with New York firms. Uh, and if we couldn't hire the college graduates and we wanted to go raid one of those New York firms to get them to move to get some star trader or investment banker to move to California, we actually had a very difficult time doing it. And the reason was this. Both new college graduates as well as established investment professionals knew that if they left New York and came to San Francisco to work for the bank, if for some reason it didn't work out, there were not a lot of other opportunities in San Francisco in order to do what they were doing. There were some. I mean, when I was there, Wells Fargo had a more, a more major effort in capital markets. We actually even had some other banks here. They've all been merged out of existence. But there were some other opportunities, and this was long before we had the plethora of hedge funds and other types of asset managers out here. So what we found is we had to pay a premium price to attract talent out to San Francisco. And even if it worked out well in terms of how they were performing in the bank, we often found that they missed not having the contacts, the daily contacts, with colleagues who worked in other firms in the industry. So for a variety of reasons, it was much more expensive for Bank of America, as I think it is for Wells Fargo today, to maintain significant trading and investment banking operations out here. So labor market pooling can obviously um, solve some of that problem. Knowledge spillovers have to do a lot with uh, how knowledge is spread throughout an industry. Um, there's all sorts of industrial secrets and patents and copyrights on uh, new processes and products that people come up with, but it's surprising how fast your competitors can come out with a product that looks pretty, well, pretty much like the new product that you just came out and probably performs just as well, if not maybe even a little bit better. Differently, but better. So you haven't violated any copyright or, or trademark laws or any, uh, revealed any industrial secrets. Well, how does that knowledge get spread? Well, it gets spread in a variety of ways, one of which is that people talk to each other, right? So you go to the bar, you see some friends that you went to college with, work for your competitor company, you throw back a couple of drinks, what do you do? You leave your phone on the stool in the bar, you walk out, you know, now all of a sudden they have all your secrets. Uh, but just the conversations that take place, people moving from one firm to another, uh, knowledge gets spread uh, throughout the industry pretty quickly. If you're in a cluster, if you're not in that cluster, if you're still stuck out in Fargo, North Dakota, chances are you're not going to hear all of those kinds of comments. You're not going to be in the loop uh, for, the, uh, for the kind of knowledge that's taking place. So all of these things make, uh, make for uh, helping to pull together industrial clusters uh, and giving them some gravity uh, to be sustained over a period of time. Now, one of the things that uh, should be fairly obvious is that you can't have a large cluster, of, you can't have a large a number of firms in a cluster unless you have a large industry. You right? have a big industry to have a lot of firms inside the industry. If your industry is really tiny, think about movie making in Jamaica. Right? Yeah, it seems like probably a pretty small market. It can be a small industry, likely to be uh, very few firms in that. So you need a large market um, um, in, or to have a large industry, which means that you can also have a large concentration of firms. Well, that's important because one of the things that it says is that a country with a large industry will be more efficient than another country in the, that has a smaller industry, same industry, right? Whatever we want to call it. Got two different countries, a big country with a big industry, smaller country with a small industry. The larger com country, because it has a larger industry, is also going to be more economically efficient. It'll be able to operate at a lower average cost. So it's in that sense that we sometimes talk about internal economies of scale being at the level of the national industry, so that we're thinking about the national nations rather than the industries uh, themselves. Now, this is going to um, lead to uh, something that we call forward forward-falling supply curves. Now, forward-falling, remember, we typically think of supply curves as upward sloping, right? But we did talk last time and the time before that about when we have economies of scale, the average cost curves will be downward sloping. As we increase the quantity, our costs are actually falling. So even though these are called forward-falling supply curves, they're actually forward-falling average cost curves. They just happen to be called supply curves. The more economics you study, as I'm sure you're aware, the more you'll find we have very imprecise language as a profession. Okay, so let's think then about... Um, Two countries here. So uh, we've got price and average cost. So let's suppose this is our forward falling supply curve. And let's suppose that the industries between these two countries um, are symmetric, to use the word that we introduced last time, meaning that the industries look exactly the same. One will be a big industry, the other will be a small industry because we've got different sized markets. So in our large market, we would, might have a demand curve that would look like the way out here. Let's call this D sub L for large. So we will have a large output and a very low. The L actually stands for large, but it's a really uh, fairly low uh, price. Now, with the same cost curves, if we had a small co a country, call it D sub S, a small country is going to have a small industry producing a relatively small volume. And because the degree of specialization and resource utilization won't be as great, it will have a much higher price associated with it. Okay. So this would be an example of a large country and a small country in uh, our Turkey. Now, what we want to think about is what happens when we open up the international trade between these two countries. Notice, just as we had with our monopolistic competition model from last time, we're now going to increase the size of the market. 
right? So we're increasing the size of the market. Presumably, we have a horizontal summation of the demand curves. So if we open up the international trade, where you've got demand curve large plus demand curve small, and we get an even larger quantity, call it QB both, Whoops. and an even lower price. A lower price than either of the two countries themselves. Now, remember, with the economies of scale model, one of the things that we said, we talked about the number of firms in the industry. I'm sorry, with the monopolistic competition model, we talked about the number of firms in the industry. And what we said there was, we know that the number of firms will increase, so that in the integrated market, there will be more firms than there were in either Artarchy market, but the number of firms in the integrated market will be less than the sum of the number of firms in the Artarchy market. In other words, some of the firms are going to go out of business. What we don't know is where the firms will be located. Again, we had this idea of symmetry. So when you're already at symmetry, all the firms are looking the same. What we know is that if all the firms stay in the business, all the firms will be losing money. Over time, some firm, again, we don't know which, is going to exit the industry and bring us back to a smaller number. But how about when we have external economies of scale? Do we have the same issues? I'm sorry, won't the firms go to the place where? OK, so what would that mean here? Which firms we go where? OK, so one, one of two things may happen here. Either these firms in the small country, one of the things that could happen, they just disappear. right? They just disappear. The second is, these firms could relocate to the large country. Right? Now notice, as soon as they relocate to the large country, they get to take advantage of the lower cost of all the specialized suppliers, the labor market pooling, all the other things that are going on. The important point here to notice is, the industry will only survive in one country. The industry will only survive in one country. And it will be the large country. So long as the industries are symmetric in terms of their cost curves, because the large, the large country already has more efficiency built into it, these companies can expand fast enough in order to get out and match the cost advantage that these large, company, large country companies already have. So one of the results then is that if you have strong external economies of scale, then existing patterns of international trade persist regardless of the reason that that pattern of trade started. So if you can get big to start with, big in terms of the world market as well as your national market, then chances are you can dominate that market. So let's take an example here of um, two countries, Switzerland and Thailand. We're only going to think about one good, watches, an industry that has long been dominated by the Swiss, I mean for 500 years or 400 years, whatever it's been. Um, we'll assume that there are economies of scale that are external to the firm. We're going to assume that Switzerland started the industry, because they did. But we're also going to assume that Thailand has a comparative advantage in making watches. So what we mean by having a comparative advantage is that at any given level of output, Thailand can produce watches at a lower cost than can Switzerland. So notice we've changed it up a little bit from what we had just a second ago. OK, so let's see what we have here now. So we need a couple of cost curves. Let's suppose this is the average cost curve for Switzerland. And let's assume that this is the average cost curve for Thailand. So again, notice at any level of uh, output, Thailand can produce watches at a lower average cost than can Switzerland. Now we need a demand curve for the world. Let's put it right there. Now remember, we assume that Switzerland was the originator in this marketplace. So before we have any international, before uh, Thailand enters the market to produce watches, we would see the world price at P sub W. Now what we can see, is, oh, and uh, let's put the quantity on there. Call it Q naught. So what we can see here is before Thailand enters into the world market, Switzerland's dominating the market at a price of PW and a quantity of uh, Q0. Okay, now Thailand wants to get in. We might know, we might be able to do all the engineering and economic studies and figure out, okay, I can build a facility in Thailand, I know what labor's gonna cost me, I know what capital's gonna cost me, electricity and all the other kinds of things, and I just know for an absolute fact that Thailand can produce watches more cheaply than Switzerland can. There's only one problem, which is what? One problem for Thailand, that is. 